Okay. So after these short technical difficulties, um, I'm happy to announce the last talk in this session. It's um, error implication in code-based cryptography, and the call talk will be given by Alexander Nielsen. Yeah, thank you for that introduction. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, an attack. But before we do that, I want to go into a bit of background. Um, so code-based cryptography is one of the major branches of cryptographic post-quantum research right now. And we have a security based on the hardness of decoding random linear codes. And the most famous example is the McAleese cryptosystem from 78. And it has some problem with large keys, but otherwise it's a very good system. But the large keys is the reason why we have several variants. One of these are the quasi-cyclic medium density parity check. And it has smaller keys. And it attains this by using cyclic structures in the key matrices. And it's a very simple in encryption where we basically take the plain text times the generator matrix and add some, uh, some noise. The decryption is very efficient because we use a bit flipping decoding, which is uh, iterative. Um, unfortunately, this gives us a decryption failure rate, which is non-zero. And we use this in order to perform an attack, which I will describe in a few moments. Um, but an MDPC code is a linear code with an error correction capability T. We have a length N of the ciphertext, code dimension R, which is the length of the plain text. And we have a row weight W in the parity check matrix H. Also, we have that the length of the ciphertext is a small constant times the length of the plain text. So for 80-bit security, we have uh, these parameters where the constant is two. Uh, the ciphertext is 9,602 bits long, and we have length of the plain text, 4,801, row weight of 90, and the error correction capability of 84. So this means that we have about 99 bits out of 100 are zero. So this gives us a very sparse matrix. But actually, this is the reason why this is a medium density code. A low density code would have even fewer ones in the matrix. The secret key is constructed like this, where each HI is a circulant R by R matrix. So for example, we have for 80-bit security a secret key like this, where each row of the sub matrices are, is a cyclic representation of the first row. So that means we only need to save or transmit the first row of each sub matrix. And actually, if we use the public key, we only need the first row of the first sub-matrix in order to reconstruct the secret key. So we will use this in an attack later. The public key is the generator matrix and is constructed like this, where I is a density matrix. And now we have everything we need in order to perform an encryption. So to encrypt a plain text M into a plain uh, cipher text C, we only need to find or generate a random error vector with a handling weight less than less than or equal to the error, error correction capability of the code. And then we simply compute the plain text times the generator matrix and add this error vector. To decrypt, we need a decoding algorithm. We call it psi h because it uses the knowledge of h in order to, to work. And we simply apply this to the ciphertext, remove the error vector, and then the, we have the plain text as the first part of the ciphertext minus the error vector. And these decoding algorithms used by MDPC are based on 
the regional Gallagher bit flipping algorithm, which is iterative. It's very efficient, but unless you take special care, you can, it's not constant time. Uh, so I want to show you first an attack before, first uh, published in AsiaCrypt 16, where the authors did a key recovery attack with about 250 to 300 million ciphertext. Uh, this is for 80-bit security parameters. It was against the CCA secure version of MDPC, and they did this by discovering a correlation between the distance spectrum of the secret key and of the distance spectrum of the non-decodable error patterns. So now you might wonder what a distance spectrum is. And it works like this, where we first have an error pattern at the top, and then we have the corresponding distance spectrum, D of E, below, where each index in the distance spectrum corresponds to a distance, and the, count the counters, or the values of each position, is basically a counter of, of each distance. So we can see here that where the distance of three occurs two times in this error pattern. So each counter, the value of each counter, we call this a multiplicity uh, because it determines the number of times we have each distance. And now I want to point out that the distance spectrum of H0 is all that we need in order to perform a key recovery attack. So this is the target, and it works like this. We have a reaction attack against the CCA secure MDPC. We just start with a variable initialized to zero, and we increment it for each round in the loop. We encrypt a ciphertext. We send the ciphertext to a victim. The victim decrypts it. The victim sends a response back to our attacker and now the attacker only has to decide whether or not the victim suffered a decoding failure. If the victim could not decode the message, then we save the distance spectrum of this error pattern that we used to, to encrypt. And then we repeat as many times as is necessary. So what we do is to combine all the distance spectrums of all the error patterns that did not successfully decode. And it turns out that the multiplicities are not uniformly distributed, but they are distributed according to the distance spectrum of the secret key, which we want. So this is how that attack works. And of course, we need many samples, but still a very efficient attack. And now the question is if we can do better and well, we just shall see. We propose a new adaptive attack with or without side channels against the CPA secure version of MDPC. So we take the original attack and we add a new, a new counter and we also need a first error pattern which is non-decodable and then we encrypt like normal, except that this time we don't use a random error vector. Instead, we use an error vector that is derived from the last known error vector that could not be decoded. And this time, if we detect a decoding failure, we save it to EJ, increment the counter, reset the I counter, and one of the differences is that this time we save the distance spectrum of the error vector regardless of not we detected the decoding failure. Also, if the decoder is not constant time, then we save the time measurements of the victim's decryption. And we call this deriving of the error pattern, the chaining method, and we use it to amplify the decoding failure rate in order to get more information that we need to perform the attack. All right, so the chaining method works like this, where error amplification is gained by generating a chain 
on non-decodable arrow ve vectors. And we basically, we take an initial arrow, uh, arrow pattern and we mutate it by moving randomly one of the non-zeros and then we try to decrypt again. If we manage to decrypt, we indicate this with the white circles and if, if we don't manage to decrypt or the victim <laughs> fails to decrypt, we indicate this with the red circles and we use that as a new basis and we get a chain. Of course, this doesn't uh, give us anything unless we save some information from this. So what we do is to take the differences of the distance spectrum for each mutation. So if, for example, if we have a successful decoding, then we save this di differences of the distance spectrum into a new vector. And we do the same thing with the decoding failures. And also keep in mind that these are all, are all vectors. So we need an initial error pattern, and we can do that by random, like in an original attack, or we can actually use the chain method again if we have a non constant time decoder. And as we can see here, that by just measuring the time, we can easily dis distinguish the number of, of iterations required to decode uh, a specific pattern. And this is for three different implementations. And so where if we take a random pattern, we try to decode it, and each time we find a new pattern that takes longer time to decode, we save that as a new basis, and we keep going until we find a new pattern that is not decodable. And we use that as E0. All right, so let's look a bit at the results. So when we save, or aggregate each distance dis uh, spectrum difference into a new vector. And we can see here in this graph where each data point represents a single distance in the distance spectrum that they settle in into multiplicity layers. So for example, if we look at the, at the blue ones, we can see that these are the distances that do not occur in the secret key, and if we look at the brown ones just above, these distances, as indicated by the x-axis, occurs at one time in the secret key, and then we have two times, and three times, and four times. Also, we have seen that if we include the inverted information of decoding successes, we can improve the results which means that we actually get information from each decoding and not only from failures. And now we have what we need in order to reconstruct the secret key. All right, so uh, let's take a look at the amplification effect that I was talking about. So this is how it works, uh, looks like if you just do random sampling. Uh, so the decoding failure rate is indicated by the horizontal lines and the red line is the best impl implementation where we have a dec decoding failure rate of around 10 to the minus seven. And if we look at the chaining method, we see that it has increased to around 10 to the minus two or something like that. Yeah, and lo note the logarithm scale on the y-axis. And yeah, there's more to say about this uh, graph, but I won't. Uh, because it will take time. So just let's wrap up and just conclude that we have made an improvement of the original deck by a factor around 20 to 30, depending on not whether or not we use side channels. Uh, we have in the more general case shown that a low decoding failure rate might not be enough as a protective measures, especially if we have side channels. Also we have seen that letting the attacker decide the error patterns is a bad idea. It opens up for attacks and also makes existing attacks more uh, efficient. Uh, we show that by using the knowledge of a single non-decodable error pattern as leverage for generating more patterns. Of course, this doesn't work for CCA secure 
schemes because they do not allow us to select the error pattern on our own. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? This is not the case. I have a quick question. So um, your technique cannot be applied to the CCA secure version, no. I guess. But the original attack can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay. If there are no further questions, then um, let's um, thank the speaker and let's thank the speakers of all of the whole session. <laughs> and, and then we'll meet at 11:40.